Thank you for joining. I'm going to get started with the intro. My name is Mikey Mahenna. I'm the Executive Director of Africa. Thank you so much for joining. It is my honor to introduce uh, Professor Nasser Abad, who is the Aga Khan Professor and the Director of Aga Khan Program for Islamic Architecture at MIT. His interests uh, include Islamic architecture, urban history, Arab history, contemporary art, heritage studies, and po post-colonial studies. He has published numerous articles and several books on topics ranging from Mamluk architecture to antique uh, Syria. Um, he's published numbers of books that we will get through today um, and is currently calling us from Massachusetts. And also, thank you so much for joining Africa Conversations. Thank you, Mikey. It's an honor to join you after actually seeing the list of people that you've hosted before. And it's always nice to be reconnected to the Arabic culture through a group of people who are interested in it as much as I am. The honor is ours, I assure you. Um, so I mentioned Boston because you did not uh, grow up in Boston. You grew up um, in Syria and Damascus. Um, I, I took that picture from a really lovely Atlantic article that you wrote um, about, uh, about your father. But let me start with a, uh, a biographical question. What made you interested in architecture uh, growing up? Um, many reasons, actually. The first is uh, encapsulated by this image. My parents loved art and architecture, even though both of them were lawyers and actually had absolutely no artistic training. But for some reason, they decided that uh, uh, whenever they can, they will take me and my sister to see either um, historical sites or to go to places with museums. My dad, for example, saved for a few years in order to be able finally to take us to Europe and see the big museums in Europe. We went to Rome, Paris, London, and Amsterdam to see the museums in these four cities. But that was actually, I mean, he had to borrow money to be able to do that. Um, so I would say the first factor is my parents. The second factor is actually also my parents, but the opposite is that I have a contrarian personality yeah. and uh, my parents wanted me to be in one of these uh, successful professions in our region. As you probably know, most Arab uh, families push their kids to go either to medical school or to engineering school. And uh, I was a nerd. So in Syria, I was actually qualified to go to the medical school because I was a top student in my in my lycée. I went to the French school, um, but I wanted to prove myself. So I pushed to go to the School of Fine Arts and architecture was a compromise. And the third reason is very personal. And that is one of my favorite cousins who was about five years older than I and who I had a secret crush on, actually more <laughs> than five years, maybe eight years older than I, went to the School of Architecture. And when I was a kid, I used to help her because in schools of architecture in, in, in our days, you did your models by hand, you cut little pieces and glued them and stuff. So the 14 year old me was helping the 20 year old or 21 year old she, and that basically encouraged me to think of architecture. So I would say these are the three reasons, nothing really big, nothing really intellectual. The number of great careers that were hatched over a crush. A crush. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. So funny. Um, but I was cu I'm curious, um, having grown up in Damascus, do you feel like you were noticing the architecture around you? Was that, do you remember thinking as a young child or as a teenager uh, mm, or commenting not, on the architecture? No, n and yeah. not in Damascus, decidedly not in Damascus. I mean, Damascus is an ugly city, actually. I mean, a lot of Damascene would hate me for this statement, but uh, Damascus that most of the Damascene live in is an ugly city. The, the romantic Damascus is a very, very, very tiny portion of Damascus that for many years was totally neglected. And that old city I did not discover until I would say about my second year in the School of Architecture. Before mm -hmm. that, first of all, we avoided it. It wasn't really a place to go to nowadays. For example, it's filled with restaurants and bars and God knows what, so people do go down to it. But it was really depressed when I was growing up. And, uh, and it was not celebrated, you know, that 
sort of like notion of returning to the heritage and the word to wrath being such an important word in the vocabulary of the Arab world did not exist until about the 1980, maybe actually the 1970s. Uh, um, and at least in terms of art and architecture. And uh, it wasn't until the TV series started discovering the old cities and locating most of their dramas in the old cities that people started paying attention to it. And as a matter of fact, actually, if you check the history of opening of entertainment places in the old city, you would realize that perhaps the first to have opened was around 1975. Oh, so, so no, I, I would not say that Damascus itself played any role in my interest in the art and architecture, but I would say Syria played a major role and, and, and also Lebanon. My mom was Lebanese, my dad was Syrian, and we traveled across these two countries, especially in the days of poverty when they couldn't go elsewhere. We used to basically take road trips and go to all the sites. So. I've been to Baalbek and to Palmyra and to Dora Europos and to Mari and to Aleppo, of course, and its sites to the castles, um, Crac de Chevalier and other castles on the coast. So that's perhaps actually where uh, my interest in, in, in ancient architecture started from. So interesting. So we were talking about this briefly before the call. Um, you are the director of, as I'm gonna read it directly, the Aga Khan Program for Islamic Architecture. And I was reading a piece that you wrote uh, called What is Islamic Architecture Anyway? Um, and in it, you talk about, uh, you mention the person who was your advisor, Oleg uh, Grabar. Um, can you talk a little bit about what his definition may have been um, and what your definition may be right now and how they've, it's changed over time for this, for this term? Well, let me preface it by saying yeah. the title, the Aga Khan Program for Islamic Architecture, especially to say the director is such a lofty and pretentious <laughs> title. I'm the director of a program that has seven PhD students and six master's students and one administrator and another faculty member. That's basically the Aga Khan Program at MIT. So we're really a tiny, tiny, tiny program when you think about it. But nonetheless- Quality, quality not quantity. No, no, actually, and also we are a bastion for the study of this Islamic mm -hmm. art and architecture. So the, and to answer your question, Oleg was a pragmatic orientalist. And that means that his definition of what Islamic architecture is, is uh, both, um, if you want, phenomenological, which is basically you look at it and you recognize it to be Islamic architecture. And for that, he uses at the beginning of this book, a definition of a Georges Marseille, who used to be a much earlier Orientalist who worked on Islamic architecture, who said, if you bring a hundred images of objects of art and 10 of them are Islamic, chances are you will be able to pick up the Islamic ones. So there is something essential about them that makes them Islamic. Oleg actually was a little bit more pragmatic as I'm saying. So he said Islamic architecture is, or Islamic art is the art and architecture made for, by, or under the patronage of Muslims. So that actually creates an extremely wide category uh, because a, an Islamic patron could actually sponsor if you want a synagogue or a church. So that would include it into the repertoire of Islamic architecture. I share the second one, but um, as, I, as I told you a little bit before the program, I actually find the question of defining Islamic architecture an, uh, an irritating question. Yeah. It's always people would say, so what do you mean by Islamic architecture? I mean, if, of course, actually my answer is, what do you mean by you being a woman? What do you mean by you being a man? What do you mean by you being an Arab? It's actually a definition, which means that it's arbitrary it's constructed, it's something that we always are shaping and reshaping. And the notion, and I like actually the idea that you have like five principles if you want. One could bring ethical principles for definition of identities, whatever those identities are, but one should not be an essentialist and saying this is what's in and this is what's out because every time that you are exclusive you end up by actually losing rather than winning. That is, you will end up by being smaller, less important. So my definition of Islamic architecture is exactly what Oleg had said, plus to that, as a matter of fact, is 
any architecture that is produced under, if you want, the ages of an Islamic world, whatever that is, in any period of time. So, for example, I have had students who are studying storefront mosques in New York City. This is part mm -hmm. of the review of Islamic architecture, even though none of these buildings was built by Muslims or originally to be used by Muslims. It is now used by Muslims, which makes them an intriguing example of being studied. At the same time, I went to the synagogue in Toledo and I found in it a fabulous example of Islamic Andalusian architecture. So I would like to study that. Uh, but I have to tell you something, and this also might anger few people. The only reason why I'm insisting on my silo of Islamic architecture is because the world is divided into categories. And I always quoted Edward Said in, um, in probably the best sentence in his book on Orientalism, where he says that um, the, how can we survive the division of the world into categories and classes and groups as the world seems to be divided, how can we survive this ethically or morally? Because every time that you divide the world, you are inclusive and exclusive. You are leaving something out and you are bringing something in. So I'm always actually hunted by this question is what, what am I excluding? But the problem is that I am already excluded. That is Islamic architecture has not made it into the definition of architecture fully until now. So mm -hmm. I will actually stop using Islamic architecture as the description of what I do when Islamic architecture is fully integrated in the heritage of architecture in the world. And I yeah. would assume that names would lose their meaning when we are all inclusively included in whatever category we're talking about. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I want to move on. I'm sure we're going to sort of jump uh, back and forth. Uh, you've been quite prolific with a, a bunch of books. I want to start um, at uh, a paper that was written. I, I put the screenshot of your, of your thesis because I was uh, tickled by the date, 1991. So this is quite, quite some time ago. So I don't, uh, I don't expect you to, <laughs> to go through all the details. But I'm curious what the... Uh, the 1980s version of uh, Nasser was drawn um, drawn to when he decided to write his thesis on the Citadel of Cairo. Ah, well, the 1980s Nasser is actually a person that doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. A, a happy-go-lucky, <laughs> uh, totally aimless, and a person with, actually at the time, with a utopian view of the world. The 1980s, Nasser was actually interested in passive solar energy, wanted to build houses for the poor, was under the influence of Hassan Fathi, yeah, and, Hassan Fathi. And, yeah, and wanted to go back to Syria to actually work on the uh, housing for the peasants in particular. And that's what brought me to America in the first place, was to actually study solar energy. I wasn't here to study history. I discovered the history, and this perhaps actually goes back to your first question. I discovered the history of my part of the world while I was a student at UCLA in Los Angeles, because I started use, uh, working on uh, courtyard houses as examples of architecture that uses passive solar energy. And I went back to Damascus, and this is when I discovered the old city of Damascus, and I spent my summers and uh, going there and documenting houses. Actually, I do have few houses that I've documented that no longer exist. So um, I do have a, a, by now actually some archival material. And also I discovered the city of Cairo, but I discovered it only on paper. I hadn't been to Cairo. I studied, I, I compared the houses of Damascus and Cairo. And then I, uh, my mentor and the person to whom I owe a lot, um, an Islamic art historian who was teaching at UCLA, who was never my teacher, but she was my, I don't know, my, my model, if I could say that. Irene Bierman was her name. She's dead now and died actually quite early and tragically. Um, she said, you have to do a PhD. And she said, there is a program called the Aga Khan program in Harvard and MIT, 
and you should apply to it to go and work with someone called Oleg Grabar. I had no idea who that person was, even though I was writing my thesis on courtyard houses, I have never heard of him. So I applied and I actually applied following her advice only to MIT and they took me. Um, they made that mistake of actually taking me because um, I'm, I'm, I was really a very naive, really naive architect with absolutely no historical background, writing about the courtyard houses as if he is seeing them for the first time. I mean, I, it was so impressionistic, my writing about them. And I came here. And the first thing that I did was to apply for a travel grant to go to Cairo to study the courtyard houses in Cairo because my project was to study Ottoman courtyard houses. That's what I was supposed to be doing here. And I went to Cairo in the summer of 1985, I guess. Yeah. And I fell in love with Mamluk architecture of Cairo. So I came back to Boston. I went to Oleg Grabar and I said, I have no idea what my topic is gonna be. I wanna write my dissertation on Mamluk Cairo. Were you, you were were you tickled or sort of um, attracted to the aesthetically? Aesthetics, or? just aesthetics. Just basically okay. the impressive architecture of the Mamluks. I could actually say that if Cairo was not the rundown and neglected city that it is today and that it has been for the last two or three generations, uh, Mamluk architecture of Cairo would be the equivalent of any historic site that people go around the world to see and travel to see. It will be similar to sort of like saying, I went to Florence or I went to Venice or I went to Siena or I went to Paris, even though Paris is not historic architecture. But, uh, um, but uh, I mean, unfortunately, Mamluk architecture is not as known, but to tell you the truth, as a historian of architecture, there are maybe five or six traditions in the world that uh, reach the same level of sophistication in architecture as the Mamluk architecture of Cairo, and particularly of Cairo, by the way, even though the Mamluks have ruled a much larger yeah. empire, but they focused all of their attention on Cairo. Just um, for those of us who are not very familiar with the history, why is that? Why, why was there such a focus on Cairo? You know, as, as I was reading in your work, the people who were doing most of the building weren't necessarily native to Egypt or native to Cairo. Why was there such a focus on? I'll, I'll let President uh, Clinton answer the question. It's the economy, stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> because um, the fact of the matter is that um, Cairo for 270 years was yeah. ruled by a bunch of imported slaves, mostly from Kipchak Turkic background, but also from Circassian background. And also in the case of one of them who became a Sultan, Lajin al-Mansuri, he was initially from Danzig in what used to be Germany and now is part of Poland. Um, so you could imagine sort of like the, if you want the network of where these people were being imported from, they were kids, they were imported, trained for 12 years in um, uh, military art, but also in Arabic and in Islam. They were taught Islam, actually. These were not born Muslims. And then they would be freed and subscribed in the army and they move up and you could become a Sultan. But they maintained their aloofness by actually speaking only Turkish to each other, by taking only Turkish names and by not having their sons who are born and raised in the Islamic environment in Cairo, by not having them join the uh, order of the Mamluks. So it was an aristocracy that was refreshed every generation wow. to basic, by basically importing new slaves, training them, free them, and uh, get them to join the administration and the army. The army was basically the administration. Uh, so we have now here a little bit of a hole because it depended on a system that uh, gave these individuals their income from, um, from um, iqta, which is basically property that is given to them during their service time by the state. And the property was all amazing. I mean, what we are talking about is a bunch of Jeff Bezos from the 14th century <laughs> who did not have the tools 
to pass on their wealth to their sons because they are, their sons cannot inherit this property. The property will have to go back to the state. So the only way for them to keep some of the money in the family is to endow um, charitable endowment, which we call waqf in Arabic. And it, they have to be of educational or religious purpose. This way, the state cannot confiscate it. And so they build all of these fabulous buildings and they assign themselves the role of the supervisor of that waqf and their sons to be supervisors after them. So the money that is now consecrated for the support of these buildings, the state cannot take it back, even though it, it, it is part of the ikta that was initially given to these uh, emirs. Mm -hmm. And it goes to the, the descendants of the waqf um, establishment. It's, like a, it's or a literal building. estate. Yes, but it's okay. it, an estate that is based on money given by the state. Yeah. So it's basically privatizing the public money. And the funny thing is that one, or actually now two Mamluk historians have studied the waqf. We have many of these waqf documents and they discovered <clears throat> that the balance between the income and the expenditure is always skewed and that the income is about 50% more than the expenditure, which means that they, beside the fact that they assign themselves a salary in the income, they also have hidden money that they will skim in. So that's why they built all these buildings. There were 2,400 almost or 500 wow monuments built in Cairo during the 250 years of the Mamluks. So they were building like 10, 10 monuments every year. Fantastic. Okay, I, I think there'll be more questions in the chat on the subject, but I'm gonna move on just for the, for the sake of time. I'm interested in, this, in another one of the books that you wrote. Um, I'll just read a quote for those who can't see this. See, this is uh, Mamluk history um, through architecture. Uh, the quote is, analyzing Mamluk's, uh, Mamluk constructions as a form of communication and documentation, as well as, as a cultural index. Mamluk history through architecture shows how the, building mirror, the buildings mirror the complex and historically unique military, political, social, and financial structures of Mamluk society. Um, you know, as I was reading about this book and reading another one of your pieces that was about how tricky it is to read the history of the Mamluk uh, period as, as it pertains to the architecture. You know, right before we were talking, you were saying this book may be the, the book that people most misunderstand. What do you mean by that? And but, why were you attracted to writing this book in particular? Well, it's not most misunderstand. It's actually in a sense how my scholarship and my interests have developed. Um, as I told you, I mean, it was sort of like by chance that I ended up being an architect. So, yeah. uh, and then um, my love for history was always very strong as that picture of me, age four shows standing in Palmyra. Um, so history is really my passion. And architecture is only my tool to explore the writing and the understanding of history. So the misunderstanding is that I'm always, I'm always seen or um, addressed as a writer on architecture, when in fact, I actually use architecture to write on history, to yeah. write on culture, to write on mentalité, to write on the way people think about things. And that's what this statement is trying to say. This book is about architecture in the sense that the, the chapters of the books are actually about several buildings or several movements of buildings in, in the Mamluk history. But it's really about Mamluk history. It's really understanding um, Mamluk history through the indexicality of the architecture, architecture as a document of history. So what I'm saying, what is misunderstood about my writing is that people expect me to be able or not to be able to be writing about architecture, about buildings is this and that. I rarely do that. I never write about construction. I never write about uh, ornamentation. I never sit there and do formal analysis. 
simply because I am not that I'm actually putting these down. There are people who are interested in them, but I'm not the person to do it. I am the person for whom architecture is only the way, the lens, the prism, if you want, through which to see the people in their time. For, for those of us who are, who are you know, drawn to trying to understand history through an architectural lens, but you know, aren't architects, is there something specific about the Mendel period that lends itself to understanding the priorities of the society and the priorities of the government at the time through architecture that's different than other periods? Well, this is perhaps actually the paradox is that the only reason why I'm interested in Mendel architecture is because it's beautiful. So, yeah, we, exactly. we, we, so, <laughs> so in a sense, I would say any person studying any period or any place would be able to use architecture as an index of culture and of, of perhaps actually um, uh, social formation, political structures, and so on. Yeah. Um, I, I chose Mamluk because of that moment of weakness in the summer of 1985, when I walked in July of 1985, carrying two cameras and a tripod and, and a machine to measure temperature and relative humidity in the temperature of like 100 degrees in Cairo at the time, and was just going around looking up to these buildings and just wondering where was this beauty hiding before? Um, that weak moment, in a sense, sort of like decided a big chunk of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I've, I've been going to Cairo every year since. I'm married to an Egyptian woman. Um, Egypt has become part of my life. Would you describe yourself essentially as a reluctant architect? You want, you're a historian, but like... I'm a renegade a architect, actually, not even a reluctant. I'm, I'm someone who does not build at all, who has not designed anything since 1984, I think. I mean, yeah. except except sort of like ideas to people who are thinking about renovating their homes or something like that. Uh, yeah, no, no, I mean, um, my relationship to architecture is, it's the relationship of, um, I don't know, let's say for example, a uh, literary critique to the books that she or he are reading and commenting on. They don't write these books, but they actually use them in order to make sense of something beside the books. It's like you're an archeologist essentially using architecture? Um, uh, I, I mean, I would say a critique more than, more than an archeologist. I, I did try in that first book to do surface archeology span uh, in, in the citadel. And I actually spent a year going down in the basement of that citadel doing all the releve of all the uh, ruins of the Mamluk structures, which are no longer on the surface. But no, I'm actually interested in how architecture is seen, talked about, I'm, I'm not even, you know, I mean, I'm not even using myself as a person that is seeing the architecture. I try mm -hmm. to see the architecture through the eyes of others and using that as my way of reconstructing how these individuals lived and what, what were their values, what were their interests and so on. I mean, this is the last project that I just finished and sent to the publisher um, is on one such person. Yeah. Um, Okay, I want to talk about uh, you, one of your sort of more recent projects, uh, which is a book that you can actually download online. It's called The Destruction of Cultural Heritage from Napoleon to ISIS. That was published by you and uh, Pamela Kadimi. Um, I'm curious, obviously the you know, ISIS and the, uh, the destruction that was happening in 2016 and, and prior, um, there was a lot of out, outrage about it. Um, but is that when the impetus for this book uh, first began or was there something cooking before then? Well, the, the book is Pamela's idea. Uh, Pamela Karimi was my student at MIT. She's now a professor at the University of Massachusetts mm -hmm. in Dartmouth and she is an indefatigable scholar. She has written two books on her own, co-edited few books uh, and she is a mover and a shaker. And um, I started taking interest in, um, in destruction and reconstruction because of the revolution in Syria and the severe response of the Syrian uh, regime to the revolution by destruction of huge sections of, of uh, rebellious cities. 
And she was interested in the same notion, partly because she's an architectural historian, but also because of her Iranian background and also of the destruction that happened in Iran during the Iran-Iraq war and later on. So these two interests came together. And uh, I would say this is really her book. My name is there only um, as, uh, I don't know, maybe actually her former advisor and as someone that helped a little bit in the writing. But uh, uh, our interest, and this has become also part of my interest, is in debunking two things. The first is that the destruction is a sign of barbarity because destruction is actually something that all political powers have done throughout history. So either all political powers are barbarians or destruction is not barbarous. These, these are, if you want, the two conclusion. And the second, and this is why we say from Napoleon to ISIS, because of course, Napoleon is usually projected as sort of like a civilizational factor, at least in terms of establishing the Napoleonic code and um, all that is ascribed to him in terms of our modern culture. Um, and ISIS is of course the exact opposite. And I'm, we're not trying to defend ISIS, but we're trying to put ISIS in the context of destruction. And the second point is actually the interest that I is still now I'm still carrying on and I teach a new course every year on either herbicide, the destruction of cities or on reconstruction. And now I'm editing or co-editing with Dean Sharp, a book entitled Reconstruction as Destruction. And those of us who are looking at what's happening in the Arab world and to use specifically, I'll give you the examples, what's happening in Cairo today what's happening in Aleppo and in Damascus and other cities in Syria, what's happening in Beirut, especially in the areas that were destroyed by the, um, uh, by the explosion of August, and what happened in Mosul and happening now in Mosul, and probably the rest of the cities of Iraq are on the way. And of course, what has happened in Palestine over the last 72 years in every Palestinian city. So all of these cities are undergoing a process of reconstruction, always imposed by a power from above, mm -hmm. mostly an extremely abrasive and violent militarily equipped power that is imposing this reconstruction. All of the reconstruction is animated by something other than either recovering the past or conserving the memory of the past. So the title of the book is Reconstruction as destruction, because we actually, and, and this not the book that you're showing here, the book that is coming. And this book is, if you want, the, 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 the one on Aggregate website, because it's actually hosted by Aggregate and it's free to download. Um, um, this book in here is basically an attempt to say, the destruction of cultural heritage is a process that needs something other than this facile, um, distinction between civilized and barbarous and that the barbarous destroy and the civilized build. Now it's actually something that is much more fundamentally related to relationship of power, regardless of whether these are within a nation state, within an empire or within a uh, para-nation uh, organization like ISIS. Yeah, you, you know, we had a, a professor Zainab Bahrani on the, yeah. on the series as well. And she talked about sort of the morality of preservation, uh, the choices around what is what gets chosen to be preserved and what allows to sort of um, uh, just sort of wither away. Um, well, she, get, she gave a fabulous uh, uh, keynote to our organization, the Historian of Islamic Art and Architecture, to which I was the respondent some four or five years ago about exactly that, about yeah. how historic sites are reconstructed and in the process of reconstruction, you destroy part of them in order to actually serve a certain narrative of history. And she was looking at the work of uh, European archeologists in a site in Northern Iraq. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, uh, Martin Luther King always says budgets are, not always says, has said, and people always quote, uh, budgets are moral documents. And I always think about that when I think of uh, buildings and monuments and anything that comes out of um, international or uh, uh, governmental projects. Okay, well, I, I, wanna, I have many questions about international organizations' interests in reconstruction. 
and I do not think that, I, I mean, I do not buy the argument that uh, <clears throat> they are not motivated by some sort of a sinister um, agenda in, in yeah. most instances. Yeah, we have a, a lot of a history <laughs> to back that up. Okay, let's get through the quick Q&A. Um, those of you on the call, I urge you to type in questions in the chat and so we can line up all those questions. Okay, the first question in the quick Q&A is, what are you reading or watching right now? Uh, I'm watching Netflix like almost everyone here. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I mean, I watched a few interesting films recently, but I'll speak about what I'm reading. Um, the book that I'm reading now is by Peter Gran, and it's called The Persistence of Orientalism, um, Anglo-American Historians in Modern Egypt. And Peter Gran is sort of like l'enfant terrible of the history of Egypt. He has written against the grain of most historians in the past, and now this is his most recent contribution in which he is uh, debunking, if you want, the whole argument about a nahda in the Arabic world and oh. claiming it to be because of that friction with Western culture during the invasion of Napoleon of Egypt in 1798 to 1801. Um, and his, his main figure is someone that appears in the book that I just submitted to the publisher and is a uh, Sheikh of Al-Azhar, a leader of Al-Azhar Mosque or Al-Azhar Institution, if you want, who was one of the foremost reformists and modernizers, but who is not usually presented when we think about these figures. The name is Hassan Al-Attar of this Sheikh, who actually disappeared after the invasion of the French. He dealt with the French during that time. He even wrote a poem that uh, Eliot Kola uh, analyzed because it is a homoerotic poem about falling in love with a French officer. And he's trying to pick up this French officer in that poem. And then he leaves Egypt, disappears for 15 years and comes back, resumes his position as a teacher in Al-Azhar Muhammad Ali appoints him as the uh, rector of Al-Azhar and he starts the reform of Al-Azhar. Now, where he was in between was always questioned. And we know that he was in Istanbul and that he was in Damascus. He was a book trader. And then apparently he was also in Albania. And this is where Peter Grant picks up that moment because in Albania, in Skopje in particular, there was a dynasty of two brothers, one after the other, that were trying to modernize Albania in the 1790s, and that he might have learned this and came back with it. So Peter Grant is using this historical event in order to say it's not all Europe. There might have been some sort of, if you want, a bubbling that is happening in the Ottoman world, Albania, and later mm -hmm. on Egypt. And Muhammad Ali is Albanian, could have been aware of this. Hassan Attar comes back with that new experience and the modernization is happening. The, if you want a modernization with restriction is happening. And uh, Peter Grant is just questioning the whole narrative that is used by historians today in order to hitch the Nahda, the Arabic Nahda to Western influence by saying, we have to look for other sources. So that's an interesting book. The other book that I'm reading for our Arabic. I'm just telling you right now, when this book comes out, you're coming back so we can talk about it. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm hoping that the book will come out because now I still have to wait for the, yeah. for the, the book is on a 15th century historian, Al-Makrizi. It's not on Hassan Lattar, but yeah. Hassan Lattar occupies a big chunk of a sure. chapter in it. Um, anyway, so the second book is a book by Iman Mersal, who if you haven't invited before, you have to invite her, one of the best uh, poets in Arabic okay. today, who teaches in Edmonton in, in Canada, and the book is called Fi Athar Inayat al Zayyat, on the, on, the, on the footsteps or following the traces of Inayat al Zayyat, a totally unknown author, and rebel of sorts, uh, 
from an aristocratic background in Egypt who wrote only one book that was published after her death. And uh, Iman, who's a friend, I should say, has, um, um, has sort of like impersonated Inayat Zayat. And there is some sort of a dialogue, some sort of a dialectic actually, that is happening between the figure of Iman tracking down the life of Inayat and the life of Inayat. And you see, if you want, the life of creative Egyptian rebellious female minds and how they developed over the last 50 or 60 years. The book is very beautifully written yeah. and it is partly autobiographical, that is Iman telling us about herself, and partly a reconstruction of the biography of Inayat Zayat, who was the best friend of the famous Egyptian actress Nadia Lutfi, and who Iman actually comes back to interview Nadia Lutfi at the end of her life and realizes how much is unspoken in the Egyptian society about the life of women who will try to break out of the mold. It's a, it's a very beautiful book. And for those of you who are part of our Arabic book club here in Boston, we're discussing it this Sunday at one. Wow, amazing. Okay. Um, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Um, as a historian, I don't like to shadow anyone because I'd like to actually reconstruct their lives from the traces that they have left since we were speaking about Inayat sure. Zayat. But of course, actually, having spent the last 23 years thinking about with and on Al Makrizi, perhaps Al Makrizi is the person that I would like to shadow. But I know who Al Makrizi is, and Al Makrizi is such a boring, conservative <laughs> individual who had ha the highest moral frame that I know. So I'm in love with the guy, but he's too conservative for my taste. I would actually go after his cocky and extremely arrogant teacher, Ibn Khaldun. So it's Ibn Khaldun who I would like perhaps to shadow for a day. Because um, he's, uh, he's an interesting figure. Yeah, that's a great choice. Okay, um, we talked about this briefly, but maybe if there's anything to add, what do people most misunderstand about your work? That's it, that they think it's about architecture only. My work yeah. is really not about architecture only. My work is okay. using architecture to basically be, uh, I mean, I'm interested in social and intellectual history, really. So my work is on social and, and, and uh, intellectual history. Great. I'm sure there's many people on this list, but if I can ask you to be brief, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? Edward Said, number one. I would say, Taha Hussein, another number one. Um, and I'm interested in people who write, um, and in terms of novelists, the person that has affected my life, two people that affected my life when I was a kid, I used to read their books every year. And now I haven't done it in many, many years. Uh, the first is Mikhail Lermontov, a hero of our time. He has only this one novel. And the second is Fyodor Dostoevsky. And I actually think he is the author of my life, if one would say that, um, of uh, people who work on literature. Abdel Fattah Kilito from Morocco is one of my heroes. People who work on Islamic history, Garth Foden from the University of Cambridge is one of my heroes. And um, as and uh, my hope is when I retire, which hopefully is soon, I will be writing historical fiction. So my models there are Margaret Yourcenar who wrote this book, Les Mémoires d'Adrien, which is probably one of the best historical reconstruction about the Roman Emperor Hadrian. And the other is Julian Barnes, the British mm -hmm. um, uh, novelist who wrote sure. few books on historical reconstruction that are superb. And then I have my Arabic, because I am interested in Arabic literature. So I would say Abdurrahman Munif is another okay. person that I adore. Gamal al Ritani, both of these individuals were actually friends. So um, uh, I have personal relationship with them. Radwa Ashur, Khairi Shelebi from Egypt. Khairi Shelebi, probably the, the, the author of um, the most, uh, the, the person who had his finger on the pulse of the Egyptian people more than anyone else. The Syrian Kurdish author, Salim Barakat, one of probably the most innovative histo uh, uh, um, novelist today. And then a Saudi who I don't know, but I read only one book of his, uh, Muhammad Alwan, 
And uh, it's, the book is called Maut Sagir, A Little Death. And it's a, a uh, imaginary biography of the Sufi master Ibn Arabi, who I still don't understand when I read him, but I'm in awe of him and his life. And Alwan did a wonderful job in reconstructing his life. That's fantastic. Okay, great. Um, we are going to move into the questions. I'll ask everybody to be brief. Maisa, you're up first. Hi, Nasser. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you, Nasser, for such an interesting conversation. Um, my question is, um, you talked earlier about how your passion is really history and how you use the prism of architecture to study history and especially social, his especially social history and how people were living, what they were doing, etc. Um, what do you think future historians will conclude about us and our 2021 societies from our modern architecture? That we are confused, <laughs> that, that we are absolutely consumed by consumption, and perhaps actually that we are also much, much more daring than our predecessors. But uh, confused and... and uh, consumed by consumption are the negative sides. We are definitely more daring and we are definitely actually more, less heard type mentality because you have now strange architecture that wouldn't have seen the light of day in earlier periods in which taste was a very thoroughly controlled social value. Now, of course, actually taste is open to anyone who dares to come and says, this is how I see things. So I would say it's both positive and negative like every other moment in history. I mean, I don't see our moment, I have to use this as an opportunity to say, I don't see our moment as a privileged moment in history. It's just another moment in history like all moments of history. It seems to me that everyone thought at some point that wow, we live in very exciting times or why we live in very dramatic and, and awful times. Um, it seems to me that our moment is just a regular moment. Okay, great. Thanks, Maisa, that was great. Um, our next question comes from Mac, who asked me to read his question. He says, or she says, I'm not sure. There is a large discourse about the reconstruction of certain monuments. Some archeologists say that the destruction of any monuments is becoming a part of history. So we should leave it without reconstruction. From, archi from an architectural point of view, what do you think about this issue? Well, I don't represent the architectural point of view. I represent only myself. And uh, as, as someone who is somewhat thinking about this subject, I would say that if we are going to accept the idea to go back to Mesa's great question of our moment, we are in a moment in which consumption is really the name of the game, then uh, tourism becomes the driving force behind reconstruction and we recognize it for that namely that you reconstruct in order to bring people to look at things. The, uh, the romantic uh, Ruskinian, the followers of John Ruskin, would feel that buildings have a life and when they start falling, that we should let them die. Um, it seems to me that this is a bit too romantic, even though personally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, advocate the reconstruction of buildings that have been destroyed. To use an example about which I have written, uh, ISIS blew up the two main temples in Palmyra and I've discovered myself as an architect living in the shadow of these for a month in 1976 I think uh, and even though I'm emotionally attached to these buildings I would not advocate their reconstruction but I would understand it if the idea is to bring tourists in there. Great, um, Luisa you're up next. Hi, Nasser. Hi. Um, I have a question about the relationship between artists and architecture. And I was really thinking about this when you were saying that you studied architecture, you have to travel to the region, whereas obviously historically the decorative arts have been, can move around the world. And I think the modern equivalent of that is what contemporary artists are producing. Do you think that contemporary artists in exile can help with conserving regional culture and even reviving it? And how easy is it to do that when you're not in the region, but you're in exile and, and at a distance? Well, I mean, if you're speaking about culture, namely 
what distinguishes the creative production of a people and the ideas about life and sociability and uh, workability and so on among a people, it seems to me that this is something that does not need to be anchored in place. This is something that could be carried by people. And I am of the firm belief, and this is actually something that is also a subject of debate and sometimes acrimonious debates, um, I am of the belief that people like me who have been outside of their country of origin for 41 years in my case, um, do carry and have the right to represent the culture of the place that they no longer live in. So um, artists, not only artists, artists and novelists and architects, and I would say actually even falafel makers and people who are now opening restaurants all over the West in Europe and in Canada and to lesser extent here in the US are carriers of that culture. And I would actually share with you my pessimistic feeling that the Arabs in the Arab world are the worst guardians of their culture and that the Arabic culture is now being preserved much better culture. I'm not speaking about social life or the social structure or the well being of the people, just culture is being much better preserved by the hyphenated Arabs, the Arabs that are now Arab Americans and Arab Europeans and Arab whatever. Thanks, Lisa. I would say, even I would add to that actually something that might sound controversial, I would say the Arab Israelis as well are much better conservators of uh, Arabic culture than, than Arabs without any hyphen added to their names. Thanks, Lisa. Our last question comes from Hassi. Hi, uh, I don't know if you listen to me. Yep. Uh, sorry, yeah, I, I can see you. A, perfect, I don't have a good English, but I try to, um, so I'm from Chile and uh, I study architecture, but my family come from Palestine. So I love my past and my roots. And now I start to study a, a course of the Arab Center of the University of Chile. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's from culture. So now I, I try to study more specifically uh, the architecture of, of the Arab world. So my question is, if you, uh, if you have uh, or you recommend uh, a book to start this study in a very generic uh, view uh, of the architecture, more the, the, classic, uh, the classic architecture of the Arab world. Um. Well, for the classical architecture of the Arab world, namely, um, uh, I mean, because classical is actually something that goes back in time. So you have pre-Islamic and then you have Islamic and post-Islamic. And pre-Islamic Arab world, I would say that um, if you look at the books of Garth Foden, who I mentioned, even though he actually deals with the moment of transition, between the pre-Islamic and Islamic, but it's very enlightening in terms of understanding how the culture through architecture is moving. And I would suggest two of his books. He has a book on the, uh, the palace of Qusayr Amra in Jordan, which is an early Umayyad book. And he has a book that is much more theoretical, but also deals with architecture. And it's called, um, um, from, common, from empire to commonwealth or empire to commonwealth instances of monotheism in the ancient world. And uh, um, um, this would be for, if you want the pre-Islamic, the book that uh, Mikey has shown of my advisor called the formation of Islamic art would be a good introduction to the beginning of Islamic architecture, in my opinion. Uh, um, and then actually for every period, you will have another sort of like possibility of books. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, self-promotion, my, my writing on Mamluk architecture would be a good introduction to Mamluk architecture, but so will be the writing of Doris Behrens Abu Saif, who used to be, uh, who's now Emerita at SOAS. Um, but there are actually many, 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 many people. The problem is that there is no one single book 
that I could tell you, go and read this book, and that would be the introduction to the architecture of the region. Um, we have not yet reached the level of being able to synthesize the material to the level of actually uh, condense it all in one book for the interested individual. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to wrap up because we're one minute over. Uh, first of all, uh, if you, I pasted this feedback link into the chat, please take a look at it. If you're interested in supporting us, I pasted this in the chat as well. Um, Nasser, this was absolutely fantastic. I'd like to end with our last question, which is, I already told you what it would be, which is, who do you think we should invite on the conversation series in the coming months? So I'm going to do like Carl said and say, well, I mean, if I if I sort of like named few people and then other people who are my close friends would say, why didn't you name us or why did you overlook us? But I, I actually would would name at least one individual who I think you should uh, host and who is not really a friend. I mean, we're acquainted and we're we're we know each other and we talk to each other. So it's not basically a nepotistic uh, uh, recommendation. And that is uh, Ariella Aisha Azulai, a professor at Brown University who works on Palestine and Israel and uh, who is a historian of photography by training and a photographer. But she is That's now much more on the theoretical level. That would be the person that I would recommend. And then you could go to any member of the group that I used to belong to that we call ourselves RAL. And this is a name that should actually resonate with you because it's the acronym of this. Listen to this. It is Radical Reassessment of Arabic Art, Language, and Literature. R-R-A-A-L-L. -L. And if the you- The A-A turns into Ayn? Uh, no, 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 it's all in English. It's Arabic no. <laughs> art. Uh, if you go back to the, the image that you showed, the covers of my books, yeah, there's okay, one right. book that is jointly authored by all of the RAL individuals, and that is Interpreting the Self, a study of the uh, autobiographical tradition, the one here on the right. And, uh, if, um, and the names of the members are all listed there, so you could actually pick and choose from them. They all are distinguished professors of something related to the Arabic language um, in the US mostly, and one of us is at AUB. Fantastic. Okay, Nasser, uh, I'm pleased to, to, good news and bad news. The bad news is we're over time. The good news is this is recorded and will be uploaded to our podcast and our YouTube page. Please go subscribe to our podcast and our YouTube page. We're trying our best to uh, collect an archive of these really fantastic conversations. Nasser, this was a huge treat for me. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for hosting me. I really enjoyed it. And thank you for everyone who had lasted for the full hour. Yeah, this was fantastic. Everybody stay safe, stay sane, um, and enjoy your day.